Fair Review print speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. The Herald Scotland on Wednesday the 10th of January 2024. From the news section. Andrew Kerr, Edinburgh Chief Exec to Stand Down. An article written by Jody Harrison and read by me, Corey. The Chief Executive of one of Scotland's largest local authorities has said he is to step down. Andrew Kerr, Chief Executive of the City of Edinburgh Council, has announced that he is to retire in the summer after almost a decade in the job. Mr Kerr took up his post in July of 2015, having previously held the same role at North Tyneside, Wiltshire and Cornwall councils. He began his local government career 42 years ago, serving as Chief Executive of different local authorities for 19 years. In 2021, he was awarded an OBE for services to the public sector in the Queen's New Year's Honour list. The recruitment process to appoint his replacement will begin immediately. Council leader Cami Day thanked Mr Kerr for his service and his work with Suzanne Tanner KC, who led an inquiry into whistleblowing and reporting abuse in relation to senior social worker Sean Bell who died in 2020 while awaiting trial for serious sexual offences. Miss Tanner found Bell was protected by an old boys network and called for transformational change within the council structure. Announcing his retirement, Mr Kerr said, From my first job as an area leisure officer for Falkirk District Council in 1982, I have been hugely proud to dedicate my entire working life to local government and public service. I always said I wanted to finish my career here, and it's been an absolute privilege to work for this fantastic city, particularly during such a challenging and exciting time. I feel fortunate to have worked alongside such amazing colleagues, providing vital services for the people of Edinburgh. Of course, there's still much to do and I will continue to focus on that until I hand over to my successor. Councillor Cammy D said, I've enjoyed working with Andrew, both when I was Deputy Leader and now as Leader, and I want to thank him for his hard work over the past nine years in particular, but also for his 42 years worth of commitment to public service. Of particular note was his leadership throughout the COVID-19 pandemic a hugely challenging time for the council and the city, and his role as ensuring Edinburgh paid a fitting tribute to the Queen following her death in 2022. He also played a key part in securing the £1.3 billion city-region deal for Edinburgh in 2018 and leaves us with an ambitious city vision for 2050. I also want to highlight Andrew's important work with Suzanne Tanner KC and her inquiry team. Though difficult and, at times, extremely distressing, it allowed the Council to deal with the complex historical issues while, at the same time, changing our corporate structure for the better. Our attention now turns to finding a high-calibre successor, someone capable of facing the undoubted challenges in the years ahead. That article was from the Herald Scotland. It was from the News section. It was written by Jodie Harrison, and it was read by me, Corey. The Herald Scotland, on Wednesday the 10th of January 2024. 
from the news section. Conversion therapy almost cost me my life. An article written by Kathleen Nutt and read by me, Corey. The Scottish Government has today published proposals for an outright ban on conversion therapy practices in Scotland. The publication of the 86-page consultation is a key stage in the process which will criminalise attempts to change or suppress the gender identity or sexual orientation of another person. Unveiling the consultation, Equalities Minister Emma Roddick said, Conversion practices which aim to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity are damaging and destructive acts that violate people's human rights. Sadly, these practices still happen today, and they have absolutely no place in Scotland. In taking forward our commitment to ban conversion practices, we are leading the way in the UK and joining the growing list of countries acting to address this harm. Conversion therapy practices have been largely condemned by human rights organisations and global bodies. Among them, the United Nations Human Rights Council and European Parliament, both of which have made repeated calls to ban. However, the proposals in Scotland have their opponents. Among them, the Catholic Church, who have described them as chilling. Blair Anderson grew up in a highly religious community and came out as gay in his early teens. He has shared his experiences of conversion practices with the Herald and told how people tried to persuade him to suppress his sexuality. For the rest of my childhood, I underwent conversion therapy. Years of attempts to stop me from being gay. For years, there was a relentless campaign of terror about the evils of being gay with constant surveillance and whispered threats about what would happen to me if I slipped up, said Blair, 25, who is a counsellor for the Scottish Greens in Glasgow. Conversion therapy almost cost me my life. The constant internal battle between who I was and who I was pretending to be brought profound shame and self-loathing. Most of my teenage years and early 20s were spent battling bulimia, panic attacks, self-harm and plans of suicide as a means of escape. Moving away from the area I grew up in to go to university was my chance to truly accept my sexuality for the first time. While escaping conversion therapy was life-saving, I will always carry the scars of it. My complex post-traumatic stress disorder will require constant treatment and daily medication for the rest of my life. He added, Conversion therapy has taken a lot from me, my childhood, my faith, and almost my life. But it has not taken my sexuality from me, and I am grateful for that. It is not possible to change your sexuality or gender identity. These are fundamental and innate aspects of who you are. LGBTQ plus people are not sick, or wrong, or broken. I have been very lucky to build a new life for myself. Not all victims of conversion therapy are that lucky. Not all victims survive. A ban on conversion therapy is Scotland's chance to say clearly to LGBTQ plus people, you are worthy of safety, love and respect, exactly as you you are. That article was from the Herald Scotland. It was from the news section. It was written by Kathleen Nutt and it was read by me, Corey. The Herald Scotland on Wednesday the 10th of January 2024 from the news section. HMS Diamond Destroyer shoots down Houthis drones in Red Sea attack. An article written by Jody Harrison and read by me, Corey. Royal Navy Air Defence Destroyer HMS Diamond has destroyed multiple attack drones, 
deployed by Iranian-backed Houthis in the Red Sea, according to Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. The Portsmouth-based Type 45 destroyer, working with US warships, repelled what Mr Shapps described as the largest attack yet from the Yemeni-based force. He posted on X, formerly Twitter, quote, Overnight, HMS Diamond, along with US warships, successfully repelled the latest attack from the Iranian-backed Houthis in the Red Sea to date. Deploying Sea Viper missiles and guns, Diamond destroyed multiple attack drones heading for her and commercial shipping in the area, with no injuries or damage sustained to Diamond or her crew. The UK, alongside allies, have previously made clear that these illegal attacks are completely unacceptable, and, if continued, the Houthis will bear the consequences. We will take the action needed to protect innocent lives and the global economy. End quote. US Central Command said the Houthis had launched a complex attack and a total of 18 attack drones, two anti-ship cruise missiles and an anti-ship ballistic missile were shot down in the operation which involved Diamond, US warships and FA-18 fighter jets. It said the attack was the 26th Houthi attack on the Red Sea shipping lanes since November 19th. It posted on X, quote, On January 9th at approximately 9.15pm SANA time, Iranian-backed Houthis launched a complex attack of Iranian-designed one-way attack UAVs, OWA UAVs, anti-ship cruise missiles, and an anti-ship ballistic missile from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen into the southern Red Sea, towards international shipping lanes where dozens of merchant vessels were transiting. 18 OWA UAVs, two anti-ship cruise missiles and one anti-ship ballistic missile were shot down by a combined effort of FA-18s from the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower CVN-69, the USS Gravely DDG-107, the USS Lambon DDG-58, the USS Mason DDG-87, and the United Kingdom's HMS Diamond, D-34. This is the 26th Houthi attack on commercial shipping lanes in the Red Sea since November 19th. There were no injuries or damage reported. On January 3rd, 14 countries, including the US, issued a joint statement stating the Houthis will bear the responsibility for the consequences should they continue to threaten lives the global economy, or the free flow of commerce in the region's critical waterways. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron told MPs on the Foreign Affairs Committee on Tuesday that Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, which had come in the wake of the Gaza conflict, were unacceptable, in one of the most important sea lanes. He said, No one wants to see escalation of conflict in the Middle East but it is unacceptable to have the freedom of navigation affected in this way. He said it was important to discuss the various factors behind the escalation in the key shipping route, but said it was hard to know exactly why. They need to be told, this is not a sort of free option, that consequences follow. That article was from the Herald Scotland, it was from the news section, it was written by Jody Harrison, and it was read by me, Corey. The Herald Scotland, on Wednesday the 10th of January 2024. From the news section. Horizon Post Office Scandal. Ministers Under Pressure. An article written by Jody Harrison, and read by me, Corey. Ministers are under pressure to address the miscarriage of justice suffered by hundreds of sub-postmasters, as public anger over the Horizon IT scandal saw former post office boss Paula Venels hand back her CBE. 
it comes as the spotlight also turns on IT giant Fujitsu, after its faulty accounting software, Horizon, helped lead to the conviction of more than 700 post office branch managers. Since 2012, the company has been awarded almost 200 contracts worth billions, with growing questions about why the government has not severed ties with the firm in the wake of the scandal. Bosses at Fujitsu have been called to answer questions from MPs on the Business and Trade Committee next week, after an ITV drama on the scandal fuelled public attention on the issue. The Prime Minister's official spokesperson said, In general, we consider companies' conduct as part of the formal procurement process. So, once the full facts have been established by the inquiry, We will make further judgments, but it's important we allow that process to take place. Attention in recent days has turned to Miss Venels, who ran the post office while it routinely denied there was a problem with its Horizon IT system, and was appointed a CBE in December of 2018. Victims and campaigners welcomed her decision to hand back the honour which came after 1.2 million people have signed a petition calling for her to be stripped of the CBE. The Independent Horizon Compensation Advisory Board will also meet later, after Lord Chancellor Alex Chalk on Tuesday said, active consideration was being given to bringing forward legislation aimed at clearing the names of those caught up in the scandal. The advisory board, whose members include long-term campaigners on the issue, Labour MP Kevin Jones and Tory peer Lord Arbuthnot, last month wrote to Mr Chalk to call for post office convictions to be overturned. Post office minister Kevin Hollenrake could join the meeting, with attendees likely expected to update on any plans to quash convictions and efforts to accelerate compensation payments. The Criminal Cases Review Commission would normally look at the individual convictions and potentially send them to court of appeal, but the unprecedented scale of the Horizon scandal could require the extraordinary step of a blanket legislation to clear the names of those affected. Mr Chalk promised further announcements shortly, with Rishi Sunak likely to face questions about the government's response to the situation when he appears in the Commons for the first Prime Minister's questions of the year. A public inquiry into the scandal is ongoing. Meanwhile, one of the sub-postmasters who was affected by the scandal told the BBC he believed racism affected how he and his family were treated during the process. Balvinder Gill, 45, said he was wrongly accused of stealing over £100,000, while his mother, who worked at the same branch in Oxford, was also found guilty of stealing £57,000 in 2009, before it was overturned in 2021. He said, My parents were spoken to as if they were idiots, because they're not white. They were made to feel like they didn't understand the system and that they were stupid. Mr Gill called his family's experience an indirect, oppressive kind of racism. The post office told the BBC in response to the allegations that they are doing all they can to put right the wrongs of the past, including providing full and fair compensation for those affected. A statement said, We share fully the aims of the public inquiry to get the truth of what went wrong in the past and establish accountability. It's for the inquiry to reach its own independent conclusions after consideration of all the evidence on the issues that it is examining. Will Miller, who starred in the ITV drama Mr Bates vs the Post Office and portrayed one of the victims, said the returning of Miss Vinell's CBE was the first step. People are angered by it, and they just want something to be done and you've seen what's happened now with the petition, and it just shows how strong we are when we come together, he told the PA News Agency. A Fujitsu spokesman said, 
The current Post Office Horizon IT statutory inquiry is examining complex events stretching back over 20 years to understand who knew what, when, and what they did with that knowledge. The inquiry has reinforced the devastating impact on postmasters' lives and that of their families, and Fujitsu has apologised for its role in their suffering. Fujitsu is fully committed to supporting the inquiry in order to understand what happened and to learn from it. Out of respect for the inquiry process, it would be inappropriate for Fujitsu to comment further at this time. That article was from the Herald Scotland. It was from the News section. It was written by Jodie Harrison. And it was read by me, Corey. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of January 2024 from the News section. Famous Glasgow Tea Room Saved from Closure by Heritage Trust. This article is written by Ginny Sanderson. A famous Glasgow tea room has been saved from closure after being bought by the National Trust for Scotland. Mackintosh at the Willow in Sockyhall Street has been made as heritage property by the conservation charity after difficult trading conditions threatened the historic business survival. The intervention made at the Willow Tea Room's request has secured the important and original architecture work by Charles Rennie Mackintosh and saved a number of jobs. Phil Long, OBE, the National Trust for Scotland's chief executive, said, Mackintosh is one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, respected internationally for his breathtaking and innovative design. People from around the world travel to Scotland to see his and his wife Margaret Macdonald's brilliant work together. As the custodians of one of Mackintosh's other rare masterpieces, the Hill House, on which Macdonald also collaborated, we see the acquisition of Mackintosh at the Willow as a perfect fit. The National Trust used £1.75 million of its reserves and acquisition funds to secure the property, with additional help from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the Royal Bank of Scotland, the Architectural Heritage Fund, AHF, Glasgow City Council, Celia Sinclair Thornquist MBE and her husband Rolf Thornquist. Mr Long said, The brilliant restoration by the Willow Tea Rooms Trust, with the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund and many others, gifted back to the nation an exceptional example of architectural heritage that we are proud to bring into our care. Despite difficulties that were out with the control of the Willow Tea Rooms trustees and the management team, the work they have done with their staff in welcoming visitors, running community learning and outreach, and in providing an exceptional heritage experience, is exemplary, and we are certain we can build on their achievements to ensure the long-term sustainability and survival of this wonderful place on behalf of Glasgow and Scotland. I want to pay tribute to the foresight of our board members for their support of our partnership with the Willow Tea Rooms trustees, which has averted the risk of potential closure and safeguarded this vitally important place for the future. And also to our members and supporters, whose generosity over the years has given us the financial means to acquire, secure and protect Mackintosh at the Willow, alongside all of the other historic and natural treasures we care for, on behalf of the people of Scotland. Mr Long said future prospects for Mackintosh at the Willow are genuinely exciting, alongside plans to restore Socky Hill Street into a cultural corridor linking world-class institutions and venues. Mackintosh at the Willow dates back to 1903 and was purchased, saved and restored by Celia Sinclair Thornquist MBE and the Willow Tea Rooms Trust between 2014 and 2018. It is the last remaining original of the several tea rooms designed by Charles Rennie Mackintosh working with his wife Margaret MacDonald for pioneering Glasgow entrepreneur Catherine Cranston. 
The tea rooms are cited worldwide in architectural histories as one of Glasgow's most important contributions towards modernism, and they were highly influential in Europe and elsewhere. Miss Sinclair Thornquist said, From the beginning it was our aim to restore and conserve this last remaining and most beautiful example of Mackintosh's masterful designs for tea rooms to the highest possible standards. Through this new partnership, I am delighted and relieved that a way has been found to sustain this global icon in Glasgow and Scotland so that it can continue to be protected and shared. Although the tea rooms attracted more than 230,000 visitors in 2023, the cumulative impacts of the disruption caused to Sucky Hill Street by the second fire at the Glasgow School of Art and the COVID pandemic had adversely affected the tea room's income. Miss Sinclair Thornquist said, As a consequence, given the importance of the site to Scotland's national heritage, the National Trust for Scotland was approached last year to consider options that would ensure the tea room's long-term security and sustainability. We wanted to ensure that Macintosh at the Willow would be in the hands of people who shared our ethos and passion for the heritage this place represents, and that is why we are so glad we have been able to come to this arrangement with the National Trust for Scotland. Ailish McGuinness, Chief Executive of the National Lottery Heritage Fund, said, We are delighted that the Macintosh Tea Rooms will become a permanent part of the National Trust for Scotland collection, ensuring that this unique part of Scotland's heritage is protected and cared for into the future. Macintosh at the Willow will formally become one of National Trust for Scotland's properties, with effect from January the 19th. And that article was written by Ginny Sanderson. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of January 2024 from the news section. Sainsbury's shares plunge as Christmas sales disappoint City. This article is written by Scott Wright. Shares in J. Sainsbury fell sharply after a fall in general merchandise and clothing sales and a weaker performance by Argos appeared to overshadow strong grocery performance at Christmas. Britain's second biggest supermarket group updated the city on festive trading as Chief Executive Simon Roberts responded to questions on potential disruption to supply chains because of attacks on commercial ships by Yemen's Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Mr Roberts said delivery times for wine and general merchandise faced delays because shipping companies were altering routes to avoid the attacks, adding thousands of more miles to journeys. Concerns over supply chains were highlighted as investors sent shares in Sainsbury's tumbling by nearly 6%, despite delivering grocery volume growth ahead of the market for a fourth consecutive Christmas. Total sales at Sainsbury's, excluding fuel, increased by 4.9% in the six weeks to January the 6th, compared with the same period last year, and by 6.5% over 16 weeks to that date, underpinned by a strong grocery performance. The retailer's first Christmas, powered by Nectar, discount scheme, prices, saw grocery sales increase by 9.3% in the third quarter, including Christmas grocery sales growth of 8.6% in the six weeks to January the 6th, with stronger volume growth offsetting lower inflation. It said nectar prices were available on more than 6,000 products, which, Mr Roberts said, had helped customers save an average of £16 on an £80 shop. However, general merchandise sales at Christmas were down 3.7% in the six-week festive period. That's 1.3% excluding the impact of the closure of Argos in the Republic of Ireland, which the company said reflected a significant benefit to sales last year from the postal strike and strong demand for energy-saving products when domestic fuel costs were soaring. 
Clothing sales, meanwhile, plunged by 6% over the six weeks and 1.7% in the 16 weeks to January the 6th. The company held profit expectations for the year in the region of £670 million to £700 million. Russ Mould, Investment Director at AJ Bell, said, Sainsbury's has a food-first strategy, and the big question from its Christmas trading update is whether the management is guilty of neglecting the other parts of the group. Non-food sales were very disappointing, implying that Sainsbury's is either leaving areas like clothing and Argus general merchandise offering to wither away, or it simply isn't pushing the products that people want. Sainsbury's partially blames tough comparative figures from the previous year, yet it does feel as if Argos in particular has been bumped down the list of priorities for the group since Simon Roberts took over as chief executive. Mr Roberts said, We've worked hard to really deliver for our customers this quarter and have grown grocery volumes ahead of the market for the fourth Christmas in a row. More customers are choosing to shop at Sainsbury's, recognising our determined focus on value, product innovation and service. This was our first Christmas powered by Nectar Prices, helping customers save an average of £16 on an £80 Christmas shop. We delivered our best ever value Christmas roast and customers bought record numbers of pigs in blankets, mince pies and sparkling wine. Taste the difference sales grew ahead of the market as families treated themselves. Meanwhile, Mr Roberts said the company was working to reduce potential disruptions and costs from redirected shipments in the Middle East. He said, Through the last three or four weeks, our team have spent time working out how to get the impact to an absolute minimum. The vast majority of container ships are instead going around the Cape of Good Hope, which is making journeys 10 to 14 days longer. We are working on our sequencing of orders to ensure we always have good availability in product areas which can travel through these routes, such as general merchandise and wine. Getting products from across the world is an important issue for the government, so we are on regular calls to make sure we have the latest intel and understand the potential impacts. Last week, fashion retailer Next said stock deliveries and sales could be affected if the attacks continue to disrupt the vital shipping route. Shares in Sainsbury's closed down 6.34%, or 19.4p, at 286.5p. That article was written by Scott Wright. From the Hill of Scotland, Thursday... The 11th of January 2024, from the sports section. Milovsky dismisses Celtic transfer talk as he hands Aberdeen big boost. By Mark Walker. Boyan Milovsky has handed Aberdeen a huge boost by insisting he's in no rush to leave the, the Pathology side, despite being linked with a big money move to Celtic. The Don striker has netted 15 goals this season, including four in Europe and has been attracting plenty of interest. Celtic have been linked with him, along with Southampton and clubs in Italy have have been mentioned. But the 24-year-old North Macedonian international has stressed he is happy with Barry Robson's side and insisted he won't let the speculation get to him. Mioscu returned to his hometown of Steep to present an Aberdeen jersey to his first club, Breganica where he played his formative years before securing a move to MTK Budapest. And he was quest about whether he would leave Aberdeen during this transfer window. Miofsky said, I am on holiday here until Sunday and it's always nice when I get to spend some time at home because, in the last five years, I was never at home for these holidays as I always had responsibilities with football. I still have two and a half years of contract with Aberdeen and to be honest, I feel great. Everything that they speculated and written about me is normal, because when you show good form and score goals, you're always being watched by bigger clubs. I have been in Aberdeen for a year and a half, and I am very satisfied, and I also hope that the people in Aberdeen are happy with me too. 
So far, I have scored 33 goals for the club. Don's assistant manager Steve Agnew insisted this week the club are in no rush to sell their talisman, who cost just £600,000 when he signed from the Hungarian club MTK. Agnew said, Boyan has has got unbelievable movement as a striker and is a clinical finisher. He scored 18 goals last season and has 15 this season. They're very hard to find. A striker that can score goals and has that movement. And obviously he is confident at the minute. He is in a good place and is playing a lot of football, including international football. I'm sure he will have his targets as to how many goals he will score this season and also to be part of a successful Aberdeen team. And that article was by Mark Walker. From the Herald Scotland, Thursday the 11th of January, 2024. From the Arts and Entertainment section. Best of Scotland, 10 of the best Burns Night events to enjoy across Scotland. Article by Ailsa Sheldon. Dressing up or staying close to home, a full Kelly or a quiet dram. However you like to celebrate Rabbi Burns, we have the event for you. By the end of the dark nights of January, we'll all deserve a wee party and a bit of poetry. Our carousing bard will surely approve. Mary Coulter House. This is surely the most atmospheric setting for a Burns supper in Scotland. The ancient halls of Mary Coulter House in Aberdeenshire invite you and your old acquaintances to dine and dance this January to celebrate Burns and perhaps imagine all the great hoolies held in the house's history. Included in your tickets is an arrival cocktail, a four-course supper with a dram and poetry, and then a proper knees-up Cayley with the hip-flask Cayley band. Tickets £69. Events at sign marycoulterhouse.com The bard would be a mu the Aberdeen's fine dining hotspot amused by Kevin Douglas is coming up with Glenfiddich whiskey to host a burn supper to remember on Friday, January the 26th. Douglas will create a special five course menu featuring the very best of local produce, and Glenfiddich's whiskey ambassador Mark Thompson will pair each course with a tasty dram. £120 per person. Amused restaurant dot com. To book, call. 01224 611 909 Burns and Beyond, Edinburgh A wee festival that punches high, Burns and Beyond returns to Edinburgh with a celebration of love, hope and kindness for 2024. Headliners this year are the incredible acoustic and electronic music composer Anna Meredith on the 27th of January and singer-songwriter and Mercury Prize nominee Nadine Shah on the 28th, both performing at the Assembly Rooms. On the 26th, enjoy a brilliant collaboration with the National Museum of Scotland for a museum late Big Burns Cayley. Tickets from £20, burnsandbeyond.com slash events. Celtic Connections Burns Supper. Celtic Connections contributes so much light and life to Dark January every year it's no surprise the festival has a cracking night out planned for Burns. The halls of Kelvin Grove will be filled with Burns songs, with Fiona Hunter and Sean Gray plus special guests to, to be announced. Guests will also enjoy a traditional haggis supper, followed by Karnakin and, of course, a dram of Lockley whiskey too. Tickets £56. Celticconnections.com slash event slash one slash Celtic hyphen connections, hyphen burns, hyphen supper. Wit and whiskey at Prestonfield. Why not celebrate the bard and opulent surroundings of Prestonfield House? Prestonfield's annual burn supper will be raising funds for Prostate Scotland in an evening of wit, wine, whiskey and wisdom. After a welcome drink, guests will sit down to a fine traditional three-course dinner and a programme of music poetry and comedy, with one of Scotland's favourite funny women, comedian and author Janie Godley, ensuring the lassies are well represented. Tickets £85, Prestonfield.com Lynx House, 
Slash the Dalmore, Robert Burns Weekend. Go all out this year at Handsome Link's House in Dornoch in partnership with the Dalmore Whiskey. On a two-night luxury break, guests will stay in sumptuous suites and enjoy an evening of cocktails, canopies and a six-course burn supper led by Craig Swindle, the Dalmore Global Specialist knows, with poetry and live music aplenty. Other treats in store include a haggis hunt at the Highland Shooting Centre and a whisky tasting experience at the Carnegie Whisky Cellars. £1,759 based on double occupancy. Info at sign linkshousedornock.com Locking Booths Spend Burns Night on the Royal Mile with a five course feast at Locking Booths. Enjoy a dram or a glass of fizz while the piper plays. Then sit down to our broth smoky culling skink. Haggis, properly addressed of course. Steak with gratin and whiskey sauce and honey and whiskey carnican. A real feast at a very fair price and all taking place on January the 25th and 26th. £45 per person. Looking booths edinburgh.co.uk slash burns hyphen night. Burns nicht at home. Staying in? Let Woodmill Game and Fife stock your fridge. In their ultimate Burns box you'll find a traditional pork and beef haggis with a homemade whiskey sauce as well as venison and haggis sausages, a wild venison cottage pie and plenty more besides. Pair this with a dram of Burns malt from the Isle of the Arran Distillers, produced over the water from the Burns Ayrshire birthplace. A light and fresh malt with notes of citrus, it's, p- it's a perfect match for haggis. Burns box, £67.50, woodnallgame.co.uk Arran Whiskey Thirty pounds ninety five pens. Master of Malt dot com. Online plus slash Tom Brown. Kicking off a year of guest chef appearances, Edinburgh's top seafood restaurant Ondine and Oyster and Grill will welcome celebrity chef Tom Brown to the pass for one night a one night Burns night spectacular. Tom Brown rose to prominence as a head chef at Outlaws at the Capitol and as a finalist in the Great British Menu twenty seventeen. Today, he runs his own Michelin-starred restaurant, Cornerstone, in London. He is joined by chef patron Roy Brett for one night only. The menu is still under wraps, so keep an eye on the website for tickets. OndineRestaurant.co.uk Tales of the Pioneer Spirit, Hawksmoor, slash Berry Bros, Burns Night Dinner. A very special evening for whisky lovers is planned this year in, in Hawksmoor's iconic private dining space, the Telling Room. Over a spectacular four-course feast, guests will try will have a chance to try with the off-bottlings and berry bros. Collective number one, the Pioneers. This collection celebrates ten distilleries that are pioneers of sustainability, all with incredible stories to tell and which will be shared on the night. Slange Mahath. Ticket £75, eventbrite.com And that list was compiled by Ailsa Sheldon. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 12th of January 2024 from the news section. Cash use in Scotland continues to drop despite government moves. The exclusive by Martin Williams, senior news reporter. The amount of cash being withdrawn from ATMs in Scotland has slumped by more than a third from pre-pandemic levels as the number of free-to-use machines fell. New figures show that a total of £7.649 billion was withdrawn at ATMs by Scots last year, although the average person was withdrawing more on every visit. Link analysis shows that withdrawals fell by 35.42% from £175.69 million in the pre-Covid year of 2019 to £95.89 million in 2023. The figures also show that Scots made an average of 15 visits to cash points, withdrawing an average of £1,674. But over the same period, 
the number of free-to-use cash machines dropped to 30,480 across the UK, down from 40,869 at the end of 2022. There were also 9,921 charging ATMs in December 2023, down from 10,384 a year earlier. It comes despite new legislation introduced by the UK government through the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which aimed to ensure a minimum level of free access to cash and became law in June. The UK government described it as a landmark bill to regain the Financial Services Rulebook. When the bill received royal assent, ministers said it protects free access to cash in law. His Majesty's Treasury was set minimum distances for cash withdrawals and deposits, which were to be monitored and enforced by the Financial Conduct Authority, FCA. With its new powers, the FCA could stop banks and building societies from closing cash access services if there is no suitable alternative within a reasonable distance. After this, the government produced a cash access policy statement stating that the vast majority of people and businesses in predominantly urban areas should be no further than one mile away from a cash access service. HM Treasury also said that the vast majority of people and businesses predominantly in rural areas should be no further than three miles away from a cash access service. The consumer organisation which which said that 60% of Scotland's bank branches had been lost in the last nine years, said the government needed to do more to protect access to cash. Efforts have been made to ensure bankless towns up and down the country benefit from a new style of shared bank branch on their high street. The new model for high street banking first emerged in the summer of 2021, with two key pilot schemes launched in Cambus Lang, Lanarkshire and Rochford in Essex. The new hope for high street banking, funded by the banking industry, came in the form of brand new five banks in one hub hosted by the post office. By December last year, six hubs had opened in Scotland, with the latest launched in December in Curluck, Lanarkshire. The other hubs are in Carnoustie and Brecon, Angus, Kirkcudbury, Dumfries and Galloway, and Troon, Ayrshire. The hubs currently consist of a counter service that will be operated by post office staff, where customers of any bank can withdraw and deposit cash, make bill payments, and carry out regular banking transactions. In addition, There are private spaces where customers can speak to someone from their own bank about more complex issues. The banks work on a rotating basis, so staff from different banks are available on different days. However, the number of cash machines has continued to decline, raising concerns that cash deserts could be created by bank branch closures and difficulties accessing free ATMs. According to the consumer organisation which... Only 404 bank branches are left in the whole of Scotland after 636 banks and building societies closed their doors since 2015. Jenny Ross, which Money Editor said, While many of us prefer to make payments digitally, cash is still a vital lifeline for many in Scotland. However, it can be difficult to access it due to the drastic amount of bank branch closures and the reduction in the number of free cash machines in recent years. Consumers are at risk of being excluded, as in-person banking services are axed from their communities. The government must do more to protect the needs of local communities. Banking hubs could play an important role in this, but the rollout is taking far too long, and more hubs must open as soon as possible to stop millions of consumers being left behind. John Palmer Director of Influencing and Engagement at the Older People's Charity Independent Age said, We know that many older people prefer using cash, especially those on a low income, who tell us they find it helps them to budget. While overall usage may have reduced, 
it is vital that access to cash is protected. Initiatives in local communities that give older people choice in how to manage their money, like shared banking hubs, are welcome. Banks must not be too hasty in removing access for their customers near their home. Last month, new rules proposed by the city regulator endeavoured to ensure that banks and building societies should plug the gaps in local cash provision. Legislation that came into force in June gave the Financial Conduct Authority, FCA, new powers to ensure people could conveniently withdraw and deposit cash following the rapid rate of bank and ATM closures. The FCA said its new rules would not prevent bank branches from closing, but will help manage the pace of change. It meant that any location set to lose a bank or other cash access point, such as an ATM, must have alternative provisions in place before it shuts. Assessments would need to take into account local factors, such as demographics and transport. Where firms identify gaps, they will need to act to address these needs, the regulator said. The FCA also wants to prevent people from facing unreasonable costs to access their money, which could be through charges, travel costs or time. Graham Mott, Director of Strategy at Link, said, Overall, cash and ATM use has been slowly declining over the past year. While we saw a steep fall in withdrawals during the pandemic, typically around £1.5 billion is still withdrawn from cash machines every week in the UK. We know that more people are shopping online and paying for things using their debit card or phone. However, cash remains popular and our research shows its importance when helping people across all age groups to budget. Long term, Link expects cash machine numbers to continue to fall. These are generally in busy city and town centres, where there are quite often 5 or 10 on one street or in supermarkets, where three machines may become two or one. What is important is that we continue to make sure consumers' free access to cash does not decline and we protect every high street. The good news is that there is now a law to protect access to cash. Alongside ATMs, Link will continue to recommend new banking hubs and deposit services that will protect cash services across the UK. An HM Treasury spokesperson said, We know cash remains king for many, which is why we have protected access to cash in law. Legislating to protect access to cash withdrawal and deposit facilities for people and businesses. This will support businesses to continue accepting cash by ensuring they have reasonable access to facilities to deposit their cash. That report was by Martin Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 12th of January 2024 from the news section. FM to pitch for Tory Free Scotland at SNP election campaign launch. Report by Kathleen Nutt, political correspondent. Hamza Youssef will launch the SNP's general election campaign today, saying his party can defeat the sitting Scottish Conservative MPs to create a Tory Free Scotland. The message appears to echo Labour's ambition to remove the Conservatives from power at Westminster, a rallying cry to voters which has helped see the party's fortunes improve north of the border and win over support from some former SNP voters. At an event in Glasgow, the First Minister will step up his bid to challenge Labour for the party seen to be best placed by voters to defeat the Conservatives and win over undecided voters. He will say his party can win all the Scottish seats the Tories took in 2019. He is expected to be joined by SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn and address an audience of party candidates, activists and supporters. Last year, the SNP conference backed the First Minister's motion calling for immediate negotiations with Westminster to give democratic effect to Scotland's becoming an independent country if the party wins a majority of seats north of the border. 
In his speech today, Mr Yusuf will attack Brexit and its impact on the Scottish economy, saying only his party will ensure Scotland's voice is heard at Westminster. Polling analysts have said the SNP faces a challenge from Labour north of the border, and in October, Mr Yusuf's party lost a by-election race in Rutherglen and Hamilton West, with more than a 20% swing from the SNP to Labour. Labour's Michael Shanks took the Westminster seat with 17,845 votes, more than double the number polled by the SNP's Katie Loudon, with some independent supporters switching party support. At the last general election, the SNP won 48 out of 59 Scottish seats. With boundary changes coming into force at the next vote, Scotland will have 57 seats at Westminster. Mr Yusuf is expected to say, The first step we take towards a brighter future must be to kick the Tories out. Let's be absolutely clear here. Rishi Sunak is finished. The Tories are done. Thank goodness. The damage they have caused to Scotland is unforgivable. And this year we must take the opportunity to kick them out of Scotland completely. The SNP is by far the best place party to do that. In every Tory held seat in Scotland, we are the party in second place. Today I am setting an ambition for the SNP to wipe the Tories from Scotland's electoral map by winning all six of those Tory seats. That is a big ask, but I don't believe you go into elections unless you are willing to be ambitious. It's also the case that in more than half of the SNP-held seats, it is the Tories who are in second place. So to people right across the country, our message will be very clear. Vote SNP for a Tory-free Scotland. Scottish Conservative Chairman Craig Hoy said, The Scottish public are sick and tired of the independence-obsessed SNP ignoring their real priorities such as the economy and Scotland's ailing public services, and trying to turn the next election into a de facto referendum on separation. Voters know that the only way to shift the focus onto the issues that matter to them and shut the door on Hamza Yusuf's independence plan for good is to unseat SNP MPs. As Hamza Yusuf points out, in swathes of constituencies across the country, Only the Scottish Conservatives can do that. Today will be Mr Yusuf's second major speech this week as it attempts to get his party on an election footing. On Monday he sought to win back Yes supporters with a message that independence would raise living standards and productivity. During his address at the University of Glasgow he made comparisons between the SNP, Labour and the Conservatives including on the EU and migration and released plans for industrial policy in an independent Scotland. He also drew heavily from a report by the Resolution Foundation, which found that if the UK closed its income and inequality gaps to the same level as similar economies, namely Australia, Canada, France, Germany and the Netherlands, households would be £8,300 better off. He told the audience... If we use the same analysis for countries that are similar to Scotland, such as Denmark, Ireland and Finland, the difference for the typical Scottish household would be even greater. They would be £10,200 better off. That is the prize of independence. Not to match the performance of those independent countries overnight. No one is saying that. But to start catching up, so Scotland's level of prosperity becomes more normal, more like that of comparable nations. It is the UK that is the outlier. While Scotland has extraordinary resources and key economic strengths, Mr Yusuf said the UK economy is one of low growth, low productivity and chronic inequality. He also launched an attack on the two main Westminster parties, kicking off a year likely to be dominated by electioneering. 
Both Labour and the Conservatives agree that the UK should be out of the EU and the huge European single market, and they both want to cut vital inward migration, he said. His speech followed a similar event held by Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, last week. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has told journalists he favoured the second half of the year to hold the general election. That report was by Kathleen Nutt. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 15th of January, from the news section, Caroline Glachan, Two Murderers Given Life Sentences Article by Jenny Sanderson Two men who murdered a teenage girl in Scotland almost 30 years ago have been jailed for life. Robert O'Brien, Andrew Kelly and Donna Marie Brand were found guilty of killing O'Brien's 14-year-old girlfriend Caroline Glachan in August 1996 after a 10-day trial at the High Court in Glasgow last month. The jury heard the trio had arranged to meet Caroline at a bridge near the towpath beside the River Leven between Renton and Bonehill in Western Bartonshire on August 25th that year. They repeatedly punched and kicked her and threw bricks or similar items at her, causing blunt force trauma to her head and body, the court heard. She was pushed or fell into undergrowth and her body was discovered in the river at place of, place of Bonehill, Renton, later the same day, which was her mother's 40th birthday. O'Brien, 45, and Kelly, 44, were jailed for life when they appeared for sentencing at the High Court in Glasgow on Monday, January the 15th. Brand, 44, was unable to attend the sentencing hearing as she was in hospital with a respiratory infection and will be sentenced in March, the court heard. O'Brien was ordered to serve a minimum of 22 years behind bars, whilst Kelly was handed a minimum of 18 years. Sentencing them, Judge Lord Braid described the murder as brutal, depraved and above all wicked. He said O'Brien was the main perpetrator and used extreme violence on the 14 year old. While Kelly played a lesser role, the judge said he was also involved in inflicting murderous violence on the teenager. Lord Braid said, Caroline was a lover of life but due to both of you, Caroline has been deprived of the opportunity of living that life, becoming an adult, having children, fulfilling the potential she had. You have taken a daughter from a loving mother. Mrs McKeith has spoken of the pain that Caroline's death has caused, the void her death has left that will never be filled. She has been deprived of seeing the woman that Caroline would have become. No sentence that I pass could possibly make up for what she has lost. Addressing O'Brien, Lord Braid said, Nobody who heard the evidence of the pathologist Dr Manjuri Turner could fail to be sickened by her descriptions of the injuries caused by you. He said O'Brien arranged to meet the teenager, but, on arrival along with Brand, Kelly and two young children they were looking after, Miss Clacken would have realised it was not a romantic encounter, but that the teenagers had come mob-handed intending to assault her. He told O'Brien, You then carried out a murderous assault on Caroline. Then, having assaulted her and left her unconscious, you left her face down in a river where she may have died from the injuries inflicted on her. She died from drowning. Addressing Kelly, Lord Braid said Kelly threw rocks at Caroline and must also expect responsibility for leaving her in the river. He also highlight, highlighted the murder was committed in the presence of two young children. During the trial, Caroline's mother, Margaret McKee, said her daughter was infatuated with O'Brien, but she did not approve of the relationship as he was a few years older. Mrs McKee said her daughter had previously disclosed that O'Brien had lifted his hands to her. Caroline's childhood friend Joanne Mingus, now 42, told the court O'Brien had threatened to kill Caroline for kissing another boy and said she had seen O'Brien bully the schoolgirl on more than one occasion. Dr Marjorie Turner, a forensic pathologist, told the court the 14-year-old was still alive when she went into the water and the ultimate cause of death was drowning. Prosecutor Alex Prince of KC said the evidence given by a boy named Archie Wilson, who was four and a half years old at the time of the murder, during the two-week trial was pivotal to the case. Speaking outside court after the three were found guilty in December, Mrs McKeach said it was a great day to see her daughter's killers convicted. She said, This is a day we never thought would happen. It will not bring her back, but at least we know who was responsible in a certain time because, for the last 25 years, 
they've had their Christmas season birthdays, but my Caroline has been in the ground. And that article was by Jenny Sanderson. This is from the Herald Scotland on Monday the 15th of January 2024. From Voices section. Keir Starmer U-turns don't sit well with Scotland. Article by Alison Rowett, Senior Politics and Features Writer. On BBC One's Sunday with Laura Koonsberg, the producers have taken to opening the programme with the two main guests sitting opposite each other. It is meant to be the politics show equivalent of a boxing weigh-in, when fighters go toe-to-toe and try to trash-talk an opponent into losing their cool. Thus far, no politician has been daft enough to do so. But the setup is revealing in its own strange way. It is an opportunity for banter, for showing that someone can think on their feet, is at ease with themselves. So it was with David Cameron and Sir Keir Starmer, one man who had been Prime Minister and one who wanted to be. Asked if he had any tips for Sir Keir, Cameron said, Plenty. Get a plan. Short, snappy, glib. The sort of thing you might expect from someone reckoned to have earned millions in the time between leaving Downing Street and being brought back as Foreign Secretary. Kunzberg suggested a wage packet of £10 million. Cameron said that was not true, but declined to give a figure. Attention then turned to Starmer. Any advice from Cameron that would be helpful? Well, said the Labour leader, the 2010 experience when he went from opposition into government would be interesting to discuss. In contrast to Cameron's answer, this response was dull, clunky and open to misinterpretation. Cameron had to form a coalition government, with Starmer accepting he might have to do the same. It was also very Starmer. No one ever thought selling the Labour leader as a future PM was going to be easy. Yet it has to happen if the party is to win the next election. Labour is ahead in the polls, but is the electorate buying Starmer personally? In the words of another sir, maybe he's I, maybe he's not. Not being Blair is working for and against Starmer. Blair's record as an election winner is still golden. He reminds voters a Labour PM is possible, even desirable, but he will be forever tarnished by Iraq, a clear case of mis-selling if ever there was one. Starmer should be keeping his distance, yet the signs are that he is becoming closer to the former PM, whether it is sharing a platform or aides making use of all that glossy research and advice available from the Tony Blair Institute for global change. Who knows? Blair might even be tempted to pop up in the election campaign. It is the last thing any former PM should do, but once the old ham gets the smell of the grease paint in his nostrils, he may not be able to resist. So far, Scotland is buying Starmer, or at least giving him a hearing, with the credit for that going to Anna Sarwar, The two seem to genuinely like each other, the win in Rutherglen sealing the deal. They are comfortable enough with the policy differences between them, for example on the two-child benefit cap that Sarwar says he would scrap. While Starmer's U-turn sits badly with MSPs and other Labour members, for now the patch is holding. Otherwise, Starmer's tendency to U-turn is increasingly working against him. He was at it again on Koonsberg's show when the interview turned to the UK-US airstrikes in Yemen. When running for the party leadership, Starmer promised a law giving MPs a vote before the UK could take military action. Cue a clip of a younger Starmer saying so. Yet he had given his backing to the UK taking part in strikes against Houthi targets after being briefed by Downing Street last week. While others demanded Parliament be recalled, he did not. There was no inconsistency here, he insisted, with a vote being necessary if there was to be a sustained campaign 
In other words, boots on the ground rather than planes in in the air. This was not the only U-turn before lunchtime. Turns out that a 2020 pledge of his to stop the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia was now off the table. We will review the situation, he said, as if Saudi Arabia was in the habit of changing its ways. Perhaps it is the lawyer in Starmer that wants to keep his options open and not commit to simple promises. But when he does this in interviews, it comes across badly. Either he has not anticipated the question, or he's a ditherer who cannot think on his feet. Between this and his reluctance to say anything on spending, he spends every interview on the defensive. It may be wiser and more honest to be this way, but it doesn't inspire people to get behind him, and that is important, especially if it is a long campaign. As for how he comes across in general, opinion remains mixed. He doesn't need the charisma of pre-Iraq Blair. In many ways, being a steady-as-he-goes kind of chap works in his favour. The next election will be the bland fighting the bland, and the electorate is okay with that after all the excitement of Johnson and Truss. Starmer is best left to be himself. There have been attempts to repackage him, but these are generally cringeworthy. As Kunzberg reminded him yesterday, being leader of the opposition is often described as the worst job in British politics. It is, confirmed the Labour leader with uncustomary fervour. He is right. He is in the unenviable position of having plans, but no power to put them into effect. He has to appear a safe pair of hands while not sending voters to sleep. And he has to do all this day after day until Rishi Sunak deems otherwise. Compared to some Labour leaders, Starmer has had a relatively easy ride with the media and with the public. He knows that won't last forever, and the closer it comes to an election, the more under pressure he will be. On this latest showing, the selling of Sir Keir has some way to go yet. That article was by Alison Rowett. From the Herald, Sunday, 14th of January, 2024. Sports section. Bolton fan dies after suffering cardiac arrest during match against Cheltenham. By Herald Online. The Bolton supporter who suffered a suspected cardiac arrest in Saturday's abandoned League One clash with Cheltenham has died, the Lancashire club have announced. Referee Sonny Singill took the players off the field just after 3.30pm as medical staff went to help the supporter and the match was officially abandoned 30 minutes later. Bolton have now revealed that 71-year-old Ian Perslow, a lifelong Wanderers fan, was treated at the stadium before he was taken to a hospital where he died. A statement posted to the club's official website read, Bolton Wanderers are deeply saddened to confirm that the supporter taken ill at yesterday's afternoon home fixture against Cheltenham Town has passed away. Lifelong fan Ian Perslow suffered a suspected cardiac arrest during the first half of the game. The 71-year-old was giving sustained CPR treatment by medical staff and paramedics at the stadium before being taken to hospital, where he tragically died. Ian, who lives in Oldham, was at the game supporting the Whites with his son, Stuart. Club chaplain Phil Mason remained with family members later in the day, and the club will continue to offer the family all the support and care they can, as well as looking to offer support to anyone else impacted by the distressing incident. The thoughts of everyone connected to Bolton Wanderers are with Ian's family and loved ones at this incredibly sad time. Wanderers would also like to thank all of those supporters and medical staff who provided assistance and for the cooperation and understanding of everyone inside the stadium, including our visitors from Cheltenham on Saturday. Tributes to Mr Perslow were planned for Wanderers Tuesday night FA Cup third round replay at home to Luton, while the Cheltenham League One fixture will be rearranged in due course. A Cheltenham statement read, Cheltenham Town Football Club are deeply saddened to learn of the passing of the supporter who was taken ill at yesterday's away fixture against Bolton Wanderers. 
The thoughts of everyone at Cheltenham Town are with Ian's family, loved ones and the Bolton Wanderers community at this deeply sad time. The club would also like to thank the travelling supporters at the game for their cooperation and understanding following the distressing incident. That article was by Herald Online. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 15th of January, from the business section, business briefing, NYC Daily sold amid high demand for cafes in Glasgow by Brian Donnelly. An estate agent has said there is a growing demand for cafes in Scotland's largest city as offices are getting back closer to capacity. Jonathan Clough of Smith & Clough Business Associates said in one part of the city offices are crying out for a quality establishment. The agent said it secured a new tenant for the former NYC Deli on Hope Street within Glasgow on behalf of the landlord, while the former Nexus Cafe on West Region Street in the city has been put on the market. It received high levels of interest in the NYC Deli with a duly instructed a short period of, of marketing. The new tenants are in the process of refurbishing the premises before opening in the near future a Sarang Korean cafe. Mr Clough said, We are seeing high demand for cafes in Glasgow and have lots of buyers on our books, so if you or your clients are thinking of selling, then please get in touch for a free valuation. He said the West Regent premises had been trading until very recently and pre-Covid had been occupied by peace, adding that it was by all accounts their busiest site. The premises are in walk-in condition and simply need a small amount of catering equipment and coffee machine to trade and are available for a minimum ingoing premium and an annual rental of £12,000 per annum. He said the slow return to the offices by workers has picked up. He told the Herald, I think over the last couple of years as people have started returning to the office and the offices are getting back closer to capacity that this has had no kind of benefits for the surrounding businesses and cafes which has led to an increased demand. Clyde workers hail significant victory in pay dispute. Strike action has been avoided at Clyde's biggest shipyards after contractors working in frigates for the Royal Navy hailed a significant victory. A pay rise of £3.05 per hour has been secured for more than 30 members of the trade union who are employed by CBL cable contractors at the BAE Systems governing Scotland Yards in Glasgow. And that article was by business correspondent Brian Donnelly. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 16th of January 2024 from the business section. Hundreds of Scottish government staff pay lower tax rates in England. This article is by Tom Gordon. Hundreds of Scottish government employees are registered as taxpayers in England, meaning they don't face the higher income tax bills paid by the public they work for. The Scottish Tories said it was embarrassing and telling that almost one in every 50 members of staff in the administration was subject to the arrangement. In response to a Freedom of Information request, the Scottish Government said that 280 of its 16,435 civil servants lived in England and that all 280 paid English tax rates. Tax status is based on a person's residency, not where their employer is based, meaning Scottish Government staff living in England automatically pay English tax rates. However, the the Tories said it was a humiliating rebuke to ministers and a portent that high tax could lead to others saving money by living just over the border. Scottish workers earning more than £28,850 pay more income tax than counterparts in the rest of the UK because of frozen thresholds and higher rates, with someone earning £50,000 in Scotland paying £1,500 more than their equivalent in England. SNP Finance Secretary Shona Robinson also introduced a new advanced income tax rate in her draft Scottish budget last month aimed at high earners. 
the 45% rate will apply to earnings between £75,000 and £125,140 from April, compared to the same earnings being taxed at 40% in England. The Scottish Government says the more progressive system is fairer in its own right and pays for services only available in Scotland, such as free university tuition fees. Tory MSP Liz Smith said the widening tax gap was a disincentive to high earners and potentially undermined business investment and economic growth. She said it is embarrassing and telling that so many Scottish government staff should be paying the rate that applies south of the border to avoid the punitive tax imposed by the SNP. While it is entirely understandable that those with valid grounds for doing so, for example if their family home is in England, should choose to avoid the extra tax imposed by the SNP, it is also a humiliating rebuke to their employer. After the latest tax hikes in Shona Robertson's budget, it would be no surprise if more people in the south of Scotland moved house to Berwick or Carlisle to avoid being clobbered further. These figures are a portent of the growing behavioural change that we can expect in the wider workforce because the SNP government continue to make it more expensive to live here. These huge extra costs for middle earners actually bring in a tiny proportion of the SNP's funding shortfall, but they risk driving away the doctors, dentists, business people, engineers and others that are crucial to Scotland's economic health. A spokesperson for Ms Robertson said, We will take precisely zero lessons from the Tories on tax policy. Their credibility rating was downgraded to junk status the moment they demanded we copy Liz Truss's disastrous tax policies, which wiped billions from the economy, endangered our pension funds, and pushed up mortgage interest rates. Official statistics show that thousands more people have moved from Tory-run England to SNP-run Scotland than vice versa in the last few years, and no wonder. Thanks to the SNP's progressive tax decisions, the majority of people in Scotland pay less income tax than they would elsewhere in these islands, and average Scottish council tax bills are also hundreds of pounds lower than south of the border. That article was by Tom Gordon. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday, the 16th of January, 2024, from the business section. Scotch whisky boosts UK economy by £7.1 billion. This article is by Sarah Campbell. Figures have shown that the Scotch whisky industry contributes £7.1 billion to the UK economy in 2022. The new report by the Scottish Whisky Association, SWA, has also revealed that the industry supports 66,000 jobs across the UK, of which 41,000 are in Scotland, and is responsible for generating £3 in every £100 of Scotland's gross value added. That's a GVA. Scotch whisky is reportedly the second most productive sector in Scotland, ranked only behind energy, including renewables. Mark Kent, chief executive of the Scotch Whisky Association, said the Scotch whisky industry has once again proven its economic significance to the UK domestically and on the world stage. And these figures highlight the importance of backing a key sector for productivity, exports and employment. Data shows that 75% of the total GVA of the Scotch whisky industry is generated in Scotland, equal to £5.3 billion annually. This is helped by legislation that requires all Scotch whisky to be distilled and matured for at least three years in Scotland 
and all single malt Scotch whisky to be bottled in Scotland. Wellbeing Economy Secretary Neil Gray said, The Scotch whisky industry is extremely valuable to the Scottish economy in terms of production and exports, and increasingly also for tourism and hospitality. It supports thousands of jobs, including in rural areas, and is a success story at home and internationally. Scotch whisky is a world-renowned brand and our leading single food and drink export product. Continued growth in global markets means more jobs and investment across Scotland. Our communities benefit and it entices visitors and residents to experience the incredible offer we have here in Scotland. Despite its sizeable contribution to the UK economy, the sector has warned that Scotch whisky continues to face multiple barriers, including the highest spirits duty rate in the G7, key infrastructure in Scotland in need of investment, and trade deals, including with India, still to be finalised. It is feared that these challenges, combined with rapidly increasing competition from premium spirits in global markets, could put future investment, growth and jobs at risk without continued government support. Acknowledging this, Scottish Secretary Alastair Jack said, I welcome this report which demonstrates the great strength and resilience of the Scotch whisky industry. The sector's contribution to the economy with ever-growing exports and investment in skills and jobs is of vital importance to Scotland and the whole of the UK. The UK government wholeheartedly supports the industry. Scotch is not just Scotland's but the UK's most valuable food and drink export and that's why we've given it 10 cuts or freezes in duty at the last 11 budgets, as well as removing punitive tariffs imposed on the US market. We are pushing forward with new and robust global trade agreements that will continue to safeguard the interest of Scotch whisky, ensuring that unique characteristics and reputation of Scotch are protected. Scotland's well-being economy secretary, Neil Gray, said the industry is extremely valuable to the country, adding, Scotch whisky is a world-renowned brand and our leading single food and drink export product. Continued growth in global markets means more jobs and investment across Scotland. Our communities benefit and it entices visitors and residents to experience the incredible offer we have here in Scotland. The Scottish Government will continue to work with the whisky sector to derive further growth and success. In 2021, as part of a long-term £185 million investment in whisky tourism in Scotland, Diageo launched the Johnny Walker Princess Street Visitor Attraction in Edinburgh, following the opening of new experiences at the Glen Kinkey, Klein Lish, and Cardu distilleries. It offers whisky lovers immersive storytelling, taking them through the 200-year-old history of Johnny Walker and aims to challenge preconceived ideas of how whisky should be enjoyed. Last month, the Herald reported that the attraction had welcomed more than 700,000 visitors from around 131 countries to date, and had been named the world's leading spirit experience in the Tourism Oscars. Malcolm Rufford, Chief Executive of Visit Scotland, said, Congratulations to Johnny Walker Princess Street. This achievement recognises the investment and time that has been put in by Diageo and the team at Johnny Walker Princess Street to create a truly world-class visitor experience. Research continues to show visitors love to connect with the people and places associated with our iconic food and drink. Whiskey has huge international appeal, and this award confirms the important role it plays in the Scottish tourism experience. That article was by Sarah Campbell. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.